Hirishi Bala, co-founder, lead developer of Open Sky Serial Technologies. Uh, thank you, Hirishi. Uh, Hirishi came to me a few months ago to talk about UTMs, and I was like, why do we want to talk about UTMs in Tronco? We're like in the embedded side, like we want to control things. Turns out that we reached a point in the industry where we need to access the airspace reliably, and uh, he's got a cool story to tell us today. All right, I'm gonna leave you. Thank you. And I'm gonna take this. I was excited and I forgot to show you the K4 autonomy kit. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rishi, and I'm going to talk to you about UTM. And more specifically, the work that we're doing with QGCS and UTM. And I know people have varying levels of familiarity with UTM here, so some of it may be obvious, some of it may not be obvious. Anyway, bear with me. You'll get more hands-on and concrete demos later in the conference as well. Nowadays, as you know, with this growth of drones and the drone industry, you have all kinds of new operations that are happening. Uh, the medical delivery, agricultural inspections, logistics, infrastructure inspections, and so on. So there is a new class of sort of vehicles flying in the air. And of course, that's the vision, right? All these new kinds of vehicles flying with the traditional aviation, except there is a problem. Traditional aviation is essentially a man in the middle kind of a system. And that is there because of the huge emphasis on safety. And what we are seeing now is this autonomous flight somehow trying to integrate with manned aviation. And this is where the tension comes in. Autonomous flights essentially have a digital flight plan, some kind of a fair and um, equitable, let's say, access to the airspace, and digital identification and tracking. In traditional aviation, this is basically taken care of by people which is air traffic controllers and so on, uh, among other things. But the idea here is that you're moving away from a traditional aviation to a next generation of aviation. And this is normally called next generation of airspace, digital aviation, and so on. The other thing that's happening, as we saw with Ramon's talk as well, there is a new class of vehicles with very, very different kind of capabilities. Some are fixed wing, quadcopters, octocopters with AI, with detect and avoid, and so on. And so the, there is like a Cambrian explosion of um, just these vehicles that are trying to get into the airspace. Um, before we get into the details of UTM, let's make some concepts clear. Let's talk about the classes of operations, and that will help you understand how this will work out. The basic one, everybody knows, it's the visual line of sight. The pilot can see the drone and the drone cannot go away from his visual line of sight. There's a second class of operations called extended VLOS, where you have a spotter who is communicating with the pilot, and then sort of the, the line of sight is maintained in this way. And then of course, the holy grail, the most advanced autonomous operations are beyond visual line of sight, where obviously these things are flying by themselves, deconflicting themselves, and so on. And a lot of the work that happens certainly so far on the commercial side, is on the VLOS and the EV loss. But BV loss at scale is really where the business aspect of it comes along. These are nothing new to you guys, the kind of flight plans, point-to-point, multi-point, free flights, and so on. So all of these operations have to be somehow included in the airspace. And while this may look simple to you, imagine yourself to be a medivac helicopter pilot who for the last 50, 60 years has been flying like a bird, basically, going here from, his, from, from their sort of um, helipad to the patient and then bringing them back. And all of a sudden, they have to face with this kind of thing where there are swarms, there are drones with different capabilities, there are drones with um, visual line of sight operators and so on. They somehow have to stay well clear of them, and this is where the problem lies. So that's why this thing called UTM is important. It's at the end of the day, integration between digital and non-digital aviation for safety. Our airspace aviation is really a 130 give or take year old industry and drones are about 20 
or you know, 25-year-old industry. So there are these two industries that are somehow trying to converge. And therefore, UTM becomes important with the pillars being deconfliction. You obviously shouldn't be flying into each other. You should be well clear. Uh, you should have this system which accommodates different kinds of operations and different kinds of vehicles. Then you have to worry about air risk and ground risk. You can't fly over people, you can't fly at night, you can't fly over crowds, obviously over prisons and so on. So you have all these rules of the air that you shouldn't be able to do. And then perhaps the more interesting thing for all the companies here, you need to, all of this system to be scalable in the sense that you, you need to be able to copy this operation and do it in multiple points. And that's really how the business of BV loss will work out. And this is a very, very hard problem to solve. And so this picture represents the UTM system in a very, very effective way. This is the story of seven blind men who are touching an elephant, and then one person says, oh, that's a trunk, it looks like a trunk, and some other person says it's an ear and the tail and so on. But they're really touching the same different thing. And if you really take something from today's talk, know that the UTM is a complex connective tissue type system where various different people feel and experience it in different way. And just like this is the thing that keeps our airspace safe and you may not be able to see it, it exists and it must exist for scalability and safe operations in general. And so there is an organization called Global UTM Association. It's called GUTMA. I'm on the board of that association. And what they do is that they track the progress in legislature. So aviation is a regulated industry. You and I can't just buy a Boeing and then fly it. There is a reason for that. You need pilots, you need maintenance, and so on. And so that organization keeps tracks of the regulation, and I want to give you a flavor of what's coming. Regulations are being developed across the world, including in the US and EU and other places. And this is an example of what the regulation looks like. What they're going to say is, there are certain airspaces where you can fly BV loss, and in certain airspaces you, you can never fly BV loss, no matter what capability you have. For example, for good reasons, you will not be able to fly over prisons, or the president's house, or whatever other important uh, location there may be. And so they are codifying these rules of the air in part of a regulation, basically. And just to give you an example, here is how it looks like in the EU. By the way, EU has a law passed already last year, so that's a good reference. What it says here at the top is obviously the operations that you want to perform. The person with the computer is the operator. Now they, in order to fly these kind of missions, have to pick a UTM service provider, which will be certified, just like to make a phone call you have to pick a phone network. You pick Vodafone or Three or whatever else. You need to pick a UTM service provider to conduct these kind of missions. This is the law in the EU. I'm not saying that will be sort of replicated in the US, but you should expect something similar happening for BV loss. Uh, and if you're keeping track of what's going on with the FAA, you will see some of this in there. But the idea there is that you will have to interact with the UTM service provider or become one yourself to conduct these operations. And to think about what does this UTM thing do, think of it as services around uh, data from the authorities, air traffic information, and so on. And so I lead a project called OpenUTM. I'm the maintainer of that. I'm not going to go get into that. But essentially, these are services that you need to interact with. And uh, you will have to build these integrations with either the UTM provider or projects like OpenUTM. Flight Blender provides these services in the open source so you can explore and expose yourself to these standards that are coming. And the next step to this is this UTM adapter that we're building in QGCS. So who remembers air map integration in QGCS? One, two, three, oh, a few. Now imagine that instead of having an air map integration, you have a configurable, flexible integration where you fill out a JSON file, 
And then on the other side, the UTM side, they have implemented those APIs and you can switch. So imagine switching a phone network between one to the other and not having to worry about all the integration work that goes in there. And that's the adapter, the one in blue. We are going to make the contributions to QGCS, TII will, and then we already have the, the specs ready. And maybe I'll just give you a, a, a brief introduction to what kind of things are in there. Uh, there are aviation standards being developed for strategic deconfliction, things like how far should these uh, flight volumes be separated, for example. Standards about network remote ID, you may have heard of broadcast remote ID, but that ID is transmitted over the UTM network as well. These are developed here in ASTM in the US. In Europe, for example, they have a standard for how do you define areas that you cannot fly on, geozones. That's the euro uh, organization does that. So there are all these standards being built now to define these data and how you exchange them. And this adapter already incorporates some of that already in there. And maybe it's worthwhile to talk about what's not included in this adapter. UTM, as I said to you, is a very vast connective tissue type of thing. You will need weather information. Just last month, there was a weather standard. So eventually, they will have weather data via this. So you will be able to see, for example, weather data coming into QGCS. Um, there is a standard for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. How do two vehicles communicate and deconflict with each other? We won't have that now because that's still in, in sort of the works. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that this is not a set thing that will be done once. As more and more services are enabled, then this adapter project will also accommodate this eventually. So we meet every Thursday. Uh, I would welcome you, Ramon's there. Uh, he, he also joins us. We meet every Thursday. Uh, we have uh, um, people from HALA and TII as well, and myself included. So you will see if you want to get exposed to the UTM side and what's coming. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because this is a regulated industry and to fly BV loss, your organization really needs to understand what UTM is and how it works. That's me. Uh, go to openutm.net. You will see a link to a repository. As with uh, Ramon's conclusion, please contribute. It's open source. You can deploy it now within your simulators and your operations to experience these UTM services. And very soon, you will see that in QGCS as well. That's me. Thank you.